OK, let's talk about these questions. Number one, what is the point of this poem? This was a very popular question today, and everybody had the same answer. This poem is saying that many people will have different perspectives when looking at the same thing. And that's true. But what kind of perspectives? How do people have different perspectives? How different can they be? Um, so let's take a closer look. Uh, some groups mention things about like uh, the blackbird is like a symbol of nature. The blackbird is a symbol of art. The blackbird is a symbol of this, of that. And I think the interesting thing is no single answer fits all 13 stanzas. The poem is built in a way that you have to have multiple perspectives in order to make sense of the whole poem. So, for example, the first one, among 20 snowy mountains, the only moving thing was the eye of the blackbird. It's a very direct and powerful image. It begins with a huge space, 20 snowy mountains, and then it zooms in on a single eye. Uh, it's a very strong opening to this poem. Uh, and it emphasizes the idea of looking, of, of vision, of imagery. It makes you focus on the visual as we continue into the poem. Number two, I was of three minds, like a tree in which there are three blackbirds. To be of three minds means you have three different ideas and you don't know which one to choose. So just like a tree with three blackbirds, you don't know which one to focus on, or maybe each blackbird has a, its own way of thinking. Uh, so here we have a connection between blackbirds and the symbol of uh, perspectives or the symbol of thinking, uh, the symbol of different ideas. So in fact, we can say stanza two is, I think the only one that is directly about different perspectives. So it's kind of like a, a thesis statement for the poem. It's the main idea. Three, the blackbird whirled in the autumn winds. It was a small part of the pantomime. So a pantomime is like a, it's a silent physical performance. So the use of the word pantomime actually makes this image a silent image. At first you see the word wind and you can hear the wind, but when you reach the end of this stanza, you realize there is no sound. You're only seeing Autumn winds is, I guess it's like leaves blowing around and the blackbird is, is flying around in the middle of these leaves. And again, the use of the word small, right? This is only a small part of the overall performance. So in fact, the use of the word small makes this stanza bigger. It makes the image bigger. Um, so this you could say this stanza is is about how like uh, a different perspective can give you a, a new scope of the imagery. Four, a man and a woman are one, a man and a woman and a blackbird are one. So one group uh, focused on this stanza saying like uh, the first half is kind of saying like uh, man and woman, uh, we often say there are many differences. But in fact, they are all humans. They're all part of society. And then the second half is saying that people and birds, animals, nature are also all part of the same environment. It's not like we are so different. We are, of course, different from blackbirds, but we're not completely different from blackbirds. There is a sense in which we are the same. Five, I don't know which to prefer, the beauty of inflections or the beauty of innuendos, the blackbird whistling or just after. Uh, an, one, another group focused on this stanza, uh, and we know that blackbirds are also famous for their singing, the sound of the blackbird. So here the image is actually about the music. It's not something we see, it's something we hear. Uh, and the, the difference is between inflections so the details of what we hear and the innuendos, 
what is outside of what we hear. Uh, and the stanza compares these two to the sound of the blackbird and the memory of the sound of the blackbird. And the stanza is caught in the middle. Which one is, is more important? Which one does the speaker prefer? The music itself or the memory of the music? Or you can say the music itself or the meaning of the music. Uh, so in fact, this stanza could be about art. Which is more important, the artwork or the effect that the work of art has on us? Six, icicles fill the long window with barbaric glass. The shadow of the blackbird crossed it to and fro. The mood traced in the shadow an indecipherable cause. OK, so this one's more abstract, but we do have imagery. Window, icicles, it kind of feels like a jail cell. The glass is barbaric, so like uh, uncultured, uncaring. And in this mood, you see the shadow of not even the blackbird, the shadow of the blackbird. The blackbird is like in the air, right? The shadow crosses back and forth. Uh, leaving behind an indecipherable cause. So what is the source of this imagery? Why are we in this situation? Why do we feel this way is indecipherable? We don't know. Uh, I don't know. To me, this is talking about depression. Seven, this is another popular stanza. Oh, thin men of Haddam, which is just another city in Connecticut. Why do you imagine golden birds? Do you not see how the blackbird walks around the feet of the women about you? About means around. Um, so yeah, some groups uh, mention that here the blackbird is not a real bird. It's a symbol of something that is attainable, something that is achievable as compared to the golden birds, which are like perfect, ideal, impossible birds. So and then, of course, you mentioned men and women. Uh, so it does seem like uh, it's saying, men, why do you look for the perfect woman when in fact you have very good women all around you and, and you're, you're ignoring them all? At the same time, we have to remember a man and a woman and a blackbird are one. So when you say, oh, men have had them and walking around the feet of the women about you, you can flip them. You can say to women, why are you looking for the perfect man and ignoring all of these good men around you? Uh, and it would be the same idea. Eight, I know noble accents and lucid, inescapable rhythms. But I know too that the blackbird is involved in what I know. So this stanza is more specifically about sound again. Accents, rhythms, Maybe not. it's not about music. Maybe it's about poetry. So in this case, the speaker is saying, I know great poetry, but I also know that what I know includes the blackbird. So if we're talking about interpreting poetry, there is always an outside influence in how you think about a poem. And in fact, uh, when you were talking to me, I think you also felt this. You had your ideas, and then we talked about them. And uh, I tried to help you clarify your ideas. But the, the, way, the way that I do that often includes outside influences, other examples, other situations, other comparisons, other uses of language. And these outside influences hopefully can help you better understand your own feelings and your own ideas about your chosen poem. So I know too that the blackbird is involved in what I know. It's not just me. So here the blackbird is a symbol of something that is not me. And this is where the contradictions come in, right? Because above we said a man and a woman and a blackbird are one. 
above we said, I am of three minds like a tree with three blackbirds. And yet here we're saying the blackbird is something that is not me. Nine, when the blackbird flew out of sight, it marked the edge of one of many circles. Uh, and here we also have the space for multiple interpretations. To fly out of sight, so the blackbird has left the circle of my vision. Uh, but it's not just vision, right? If we don't see the blackbird, if the blackbird leaves the poem, then it's also the edge of the poem. If it leaves our memory, it is the edge of our recollection. Something leaving reveals the boundary. And it's always more than one kind of boundary because everything is always more than one kind of thing. A blackbird is not just a blackbird. Sorry, I'm going a little fast because I, I want to leave time for the midterm exam. 10, at the sight of blackbirds flying in a green light, even the bods of euphony would cry out sharply. Uh, euphony is uh, good sounds. Bod is a kind of popular musical performer. So it's saying like even people who, uh, I guess, enjoy or are good at musical performance would shout out if they see a blackbird flying in the sky. Um, so this is where we bring in the other meaning of blackbird, or the common meaning of blackbird, which is a symbol of bad luck. So it this is representing how uh, like a sudden stroke of bad luck could disrupt uh, your plans for um, enjoyment and recreation. Life is unpredictable. 11, he rode over Connecticut in a glass coach. Uh, a coach is a horse-drawn carriage. Once a fear pierced him in that he mistook the shadow of his equipage for blackbirds. So again, blackbird as a, a symbol of unluckiness, misfortune. But here, the shadow is always on the ground. So in a literal sense, we can say that maybe he's afraid that he would run over a blackbird. Um, so it's also a sense of concern and care. And we can also talk about this glass coach thing. You ride in a glass coach if you want to see outside and if you're not afraid of being seen by other people. So this is a, an expression of connection to the outside world. Uh, and instead of people, he sees blackbirds and his concern for the blackbirds made him afraid that maybe he had hurt them, something like that. 12, the river is moving, the blackbird must be flying. Uh, two groups focused on this stanza. One group said this is a, it's an image of time passing. If the river is moving, the blackbird must also be doing something and time must be passing. Things are happening. Uh, life is not just one long, boring day. The other group said that this could be a symbol of freedom. Uh, the river isn't staying still, it's moving. The blackbird isn't sitting still, it's flying. Um, and so for a person who sees this, it could give them, it could inspire them with a sense of freedom. And finally, stanza 13, it was evening all afternoon. It was snowing and it was going to snow. The blackbird sat in the cedar limbs. So one group took uh, also discussed the stanza. To them, it, it kind of said, in a bad situation, right? It's evening all afternoon. So all afternoon, it was dark. It was snowing and it's going to keep snowing. Not good weather. And yet in the middle, the blackbird is sitting like nothing's happening. Like there's no danger, no worry at all. The blackbird here is a symbol of eternal perseverance. It's, it, it's approaching something immortal. It's like no matter what happens, there will always be a blackbird sitting there. It's something you can depend on. And in fact, because it is the last stanza of the poem, it is the last thing that we remember from this poem, the image of a blackbird sitting in the tree. You may have already forgotten the earlier stanzas, but the blackbird is still there in your mind.
no matter what else has been lost to the darkness and the snow of your memory. So yes, it is about different perspectives, but look at how different these perspectives are. Isn't that amazing? Okay, questions about the, this poem? By the way, do you guys know the TV show 13 Reasons Why? Yeah, that's where the title comes from. Okay, question two. Nobody took this question, so let's look at this together. Uh, anecdote of the jar. Why is the wilderness long, no longer wild? How does the jar take the binion? Okay. Anecdote of the jar. Anecdote means short story, like a story you would tell at a party. I placed the jar in Tennessee and round it was upon a hill. It made the slovenly wilderness surround that hill. Okay, interesting. Uh, so at this point in American history, Tennessee is considered a, like half wild, half rural. So it's not like a city, it's probably like a small town. So a jar is put on a hill and around that hill, we can say that nature was already around that hill. So the poem is saying by putting the jar on top, it makes the nature wild. Uh, and the logic here seems to be the logic of contrast. If you're just a, like, if you just walk around in nature, it just feels like nature, no big deal. But if in the middle, you suddenly see a jar which can only be created by humans. Then suddenly the nature around you starts to feel more wild, less human. The wilderness rose up to it and sprawled around no longer wild. So we answered our first question. How does the jar make the nature more wild? By contrast. The jar was round upon the ground and tall and of a port in air. So round on the ground. In nature, there are very few things that are like perfectly shaped like a jar. Uh, so that that emphasizes its difference from a natural object. And then it's tall and of a port in air. So I guess this is like a taller jar. Uh, so as if it's an air. I don't want to say airport because today you, I say airport. You think of long runways, big buildings. A port in air is more like a zeppelin port. Qi chuan zhan. Zeppelins have to always be in the air, so the zeppelin port has to be really high in the sky. It took dominion everywhere. It took control everywhere. The jar was gray and bare. It did not give of bird or bush like nothing else in Tennessee. Uh, so the jar does not let birds feed from it. It does not help bushes grow. It is just there. It is in contrast to nature. It is not part of nature. Nature cannot take control over it. And therefore, we can say that it is more powerful than nature. That's how it takes dominion. That's how it takes control. Questions? Moving on. Those two were by Wallace Stevens. Let's look at William Carlos Williams. Question three was one of today's most popular. The poem says, so much depends on, on, upon a red wheelbarrow. The question is, why? Why is this red wheelbarrow so important? So much depends upon a red wheelbarrow glazed with rainwater beside the white chickens. And the first thing we feel when we read this poem is it's a very clear image. We see a red wheelbarrow. It's, we Then we see that it's covered in rainwater, and then beside it we see some white chickens. We see exactly what the poem wants us to see. And we would not have that effect if we did not have the word red. If it just says so much depends on a wheelbarrow, then the, the fact that it's covered with rainwater is less easily imagined. 
And then when it says chickens, we don't see white chickens. We maybe don't even see chickens. We just think, oh, there's chickens over there. It's the fact that there it is a red wheelbarrow. And of course, red is a very um, interesting color. It's a color that draws our attention. If you see somebody wearing red clothing, if you see a red car, right, it draws our attention. So why what depends on this red wheelbarrow? Why is it so important? Because it is this red wheelbarrow that gives us the image of the poem. Without this red wheelbarrow, the poem would not work. In fact, if you take out the red wheelbarrow from this poem, if you just ignore these two lines, the poem doesn't make sense. The poem literally depends on this red wheelbarrow. And you might be thinking, OK, so it's it's because it's red. Well, what if we change the color? So it doesn't have to depend on a red wheelbarrow, right? Uh, but it turns out that if you. If you look at the structure of the poem. The nouns all take up their own lines. So if you, if you change the color, but you take out the fact that it's a real uh, it's a wheelbarrow, the poem also collapses. So it has to be red and it has to be the wheelbarrow in order for the poem to make sense. Questions? OK, um, the next question, this is just to say you can take the time to, to read this one more time to think about it. Uh, I will be right back. OK, let's continue. Question four. This was today's most popular question. How do these people feel about the situation? So this is just to say. And in this poem, the title is also part of the poem. This is just to say I have eaten the plums that were in the icebox in which you were probably saving for breakfast. Forgive me, they were delicious, so sweet and so cold. So it it's technically an apology, but most of the poem is not about saying sorry. 
uh, as many of you noticed, it is deliberately light and carefree. All right. This is just to say it's not very serious. It's like, oh, by the way. Uh, and then it doesn't feel very sorry about eating the plums, right? It's like, I have eaten the plums. Uh, no feeling of shame at all. Uh, even though the speaker knows that the addressee was probably saving them for breakfast. And then even after saying, forgive me, they say that the plums were delicious, so sweet and so cold. The plums that the addressee now cannot eat. The speaker is describing in such delicious terms. Uh, so it does feel like the speaker knows that they should not have eaten the plums, but they don't feel too sorry about it. In fact, it's kind of like it's taunting the addressee. Um, which is kind of interesting, right? Because this is so this is a mistake that the speaker made or something wrong that the speaker did, and yet they don't seem very sorry. Well, how about the addressee? And for this, we have to use some imagination. You wake up, you walk over to the icebox to grab your breakfast, and you realize, oh no, the plums are gone. What happened? And then maybe on top of the icebox, or maybe on the kitchen table, you see this poem. How would that make you feel? And the groups I talked to had two answers. One answer is even angrier. You already ate my plums, and now you're taunting me with this poem? Uh, but another answer is, it would make me feel less angry. And now I know what happened to the plums, I know who ate them, and I have this apology. Um, and so it really depends on what kind of relationship you think these two people have. If the speaker often eats the addressee's food, then yeah, maybe the addressee would be angered even more by this note. But if they have a good relationship, if they know, how do I say this? So the, the speaker knows that the addressee might get angry. So even though the speaker doesn't feel very sorry, they don't want the addressee to feel angry, and so they write this note. So the point is not how serious is this apology. The point is that even when the speaker doesn't feel sorry, they care about the addressee enough to write some kind of apology. It's, a, it's an act of maintaining their relationship. And so if the addressee understands this, then even though it's kind of not a very serious apology, uh, they might feel less angry. In fact, if the addressee does not think that this is a big issue, it's only like a small mistake, then um, you know, writing a more serious apology actually might make them even more angry. It's like, I don't, I'm not that angry. Why would you think I would be so angry that you need to write me a serious apology? Um, so, in fact, treating this as a small incident could help uh, lessen the addressee's anger. And then one group had a very good observation, which is uh, maybe the addressee would uh, write a reply poem pretending to be angry. Uh, and that reflects the kind of relationship they might have, a very playful, forgiving relationship. Uh, and forgiving brings us to another point made by another group, which is this is also a poem about temptation. It's kind of like the story of Adam and Eve, right? Adam and Eve were tempted. They ate the forbidden fruit. God damned them to hell forever. And then only 2,000 years later forgave them through Jesus Christ. In that story, God is much more powerful than humans. Humans cannot apologize because they have no way to make it up to God. They had to wait for God to sacrifice his son in order to be able to repay the debt. But here, that's not what happens, right? Here, the speaker asks for forgiveness in a very lighthearted way, which tells us that the speaker expects 
the addressee to forgive them. The, the, the speaker does not expect the addressee to be that angry. So here it's a relationship among equals. Uh, the speaker, the, the addressee, neither of them have all the power in this relationship. So if this note is an act of maintaining the relationship, the fact that it's a poem also adds to this. This is not just two sentences on a piece of paper. This is arranged in the form of a poem. So it shows that the speaker has put a lot of thought into this note, has really considered the best way to arrange these words. Um, and that tells the addressee that even though the, the content seems kind of careless and like ordinary, but in fact, it's the effect of the poem. It is a very careful poem that is designed to feel careless. It is designed to feel every day. Um, and so like there are at least three layers of irony in this poem, right? Mistake, uh, a kind of careless joking reply, but it's written like a poem, so it's actually a very careful reply that is designed to look careless about this incident. And these layers of irony are why this poem is actually very commonly seen online as a, as a kind of meme. Uh, anytime you need a way to make fun of somebody's fake apology, or you need a way to, to uh, pretend to apologize for something that you really do, you do not feel like you need to apologize for. Somebody will bring out some version of this poem and change the keywords to make it fit the situation. Okay, do you have questions about this one? Okay, finally, question five. So, Nobody took this question. Uh, let's look at these poems together, right? So Wallace Stevens wrote the first two. We notice that both of these poems are very philosophical. They use abstract language. Uh, they represent metaphors and symbols and ideas using imagery. Well, what about the two by William Carlos Williams that we have looked at? The Red Wheelbarrow is about the imagery. Although you can say like it's a symbol of hope, right? In like uh, it, the rain has stopped, I think. Uh, it's a, a vision of ordinary life, but it's imbued with the meaning that the artist's gaze gives it. It's ordinary, but because the poet looks at this image and describes it for us, this poem itself gives that image meaning tells us it's something to focus on, tells us that life is full of these everyday beautiful images. And so you can also see this poem as a symbol of hope, but none of that is in the language. The language is just very simple. Same for this is just to say, right? Very simple daily situation. Uh, the way that the first two stanzas describe it, it's very clear what happened. And yet, after looking at it, we realize that there are many layers of meaning, and it's a way to express a complex and intimate relationship between two people. And then we have one more poem. Landscape with the Fall of Icarus. I should show you what this looks like. This is a painting. Did you guys look up this painting? I mean, it's a very famous painting. This one. So the story of Icarus, uh, it's a long story, but let's start from the middle. Icarus's father is stuck in the middle of a maze. Uh, he's stuck there with his son. And so in order to escape, uh, they're stuck in the middle of the maze in a, no, that's the Minotaur. Sorry. They're stuck in a high tower. And in order to escape, uh, his father builds wings out of wax. 用蜡做的。那个翅膀, 
and they kind of fly out. And he tells his son Icarus, don't fly too close to the sun or your wax will melt. And Icarus doesn't listen. He flies higher and higher, his wings melt, and he falls. So that is the fall of Icarus. But this is a landscape with the fall of Icarus. This is a very important mythological event. But the focus is on the landscape. Do you see Icarus? Here. He's a very small detail in this very big painting. And that's what this poem is about. Uh, where is it? According to Bruegel, who, the painter, when Icarus fell, it was spring. A farmer was plowing his field. The whole pageantry, which means performance, of the year was awake, tingling near. The edge of the sea concerned with itself, sweating in the sun that melted the wings wax. Unsignificantly off the coast, there was a splash. Quite unnoticed, this was Icarus drowning. So it's describing that poem. Uh, and using the same logic as the previous two poems, it's using very simple language, very clear imagery in order to express the complex idea of the painting, which is that, yes, it is a very important mythological story, but even more important than that is everyday life. The people going about their daily lives as farmers, as sailors, the year coming back to spring and summer. Yes, mythology is happening, but it's happening in the background. So to answer this question, we can say that Stevens uses imagery for philosophical reasons and uses philosophical abstract language to express those images. Whereas Williams gives us ordinary, everyday, and very clear images that in fact hide a lot of complex ideas. And that you really have to it, it's not obvious, but if you think more closely about Williams's poems, they are equally as sophisticated as Stevens's, even when they look so simple. OK, questions about today's discussion? OK, midterm exam. Um, so the midterm exam is an essay question that you can take home to do. The exam will begin today when the bell rings in seven minutes, and it will end next Friday at midnight. It is one essay question. Uh, let me give you the rules first, and then we will look at the question together. So your answer must be in English. It has to be an essay, and you must not give me itemized paragraphs. So don't say uh, one, blah, 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 two, blah, blah, blah. Don't use bullet points. I want an essay with multiple paragraphs. Um, if the question gives you options, you must choose one of the options. So if it says, do you think this or that? You cannot say both. You cannot say neither. You cannot say it depends. If the question says this or that, you have to choose either this or that. Uh, and if you don't do, uh, if some of these things you don't do, you will get 50%. It doesn't matter what you say in the rest of your answer. If you miss some of these requirements, you will only get 50%. You, the, there is no timer. There's only a deadline. So you can look at the question, write it somewhere else, and then copy and paste it into Moodle. Please do not copy and paste a link to a Google Doc. Somebody once did this. Please copy and paste your actual answer. Um, before the deadline, you can submit multiple answers and I will only give you the highest grade. So like if after you finish and you submit, you go take a shower and in the middle of your shower, you think of something you forgot to say, you can submit a second answer and I will only give you the highest grade. They are open book questions. You can use any resource you want, the handout, the notes, the recordings, the internet, the library. You can talk to me, but you cannot talk to anybody else. Only me. Uh, not even Siren Jin. Um, now, here's the most important part. To support your answer, you will have to choose to talk about 
some of the things that we have read in class. And from the things that you choose, you have to give me at least four pieces of specific evidence. So you can look at one thing, you can look at two things, you can look at eight things or more, but you have to give me at least four pieces of specific evidence. By specific, I mean you can tell me the page number or the line number. Where in your chosen text is your evidence? That's what specific means. Um, you can give more than four, right? And these pieces of, of evidence must explain your answer. You can't just give me four random pieces of evidence. You have to tell me how do they help create your answer? How do they help explain your answer? Now, if you look at other information, please also give me the source. Like a web address or the page number, or if it's a video, the timestamp, and please put it right next to the information that you use. Don't just give me a bibliography at the very end. Put it in your answer. If you say, I went to this website, give me the website right there and tell me what you found. If you say, I found this information from a video, give me the video and the time right there, not at the bottom. If you put it all at the bottom, doesn't count. Uh, that's what this says. If you put it all at the bottom, if you don't give me the location, it doesn't count. Finally, don't cheat. You can look at any information, right? You don't have to steal. Just tell me where you found it. Even if it's the smallest thing, if I can tell that you copied it from somewhere, that's cheating. Questions about the rules? Okay, let's look at the question. Oh, sorry, one last thing before we look at the question. This is a bad example. This is an example of an answer that is bad. Look at this, item, colon, answer. This is called itemized, don't do this. Just give me a coherent essay. Don't give me like these subtitles, these sections. And you also notice there is no source, no page numbers, no line numbers. So this is bad, don't do this. Okay, the question, midterm exam. Read the midterm exam text on Moodle, then choose a text or text that we have read in class. Do you think the exam text describes your chosen text or texts? Why or why not? And there's a really big space down here. Don't worry about filling this space. It is infinite. If you fill it, it will keep expanding. This is just to encourage you to write more. So what is the midterm exam text? I need to make this visible to you. Here, midterm exam text. So read this, choose some things that we have already read, and answer if you think this describes the things that you chose. Uh, this is a selection from an essay by Andrew Carnegie, Carnegie. Carnegie, uh, Carnegie got rich from I think it was oil. He wrote this essay called The Gospel of Wealth. And the basic idea I will tell you right now is that um, it is a, it is no uh, how should I say, getting rich is good, but only if you spend that money to improve society. That's the basic idea. But you should look in detail at what he says. It's three pages. So see if the way that he talks about wealth can describe the way that, or some elements of what we have been reading so far this semester. You can say no. Your answer can say no, it does not describe what I have chosen, but then you have to explain why not. Questions? OK, I'm sure you have questions. You can ask me during the break. You can send me an email. Um, the exam has begun. You have one week. 
we, you should also read some things for next week. Yeah, I gave you the new handout, so you also should read uh, five poems. I mean, you can try to read them. You may not understand them. Um, one poem by Marianne Moore. One poem by Ezra Pound. One poem by Gertrude Stein. And two poems by E.E. E. Cummings. That's five poems. For next week. Up to page four. OK, see you next week.